Again, you guys are just fantastic. Thank you so much for watching us on such great music, getting our hearts ready to hear from the Word of God. And that song, Romans 8, 31, God is for me, who can be against me, no one. Um, it's just the best. It's just the best because, you know, I think the greatest disease we have nowadays is insecurity. I don't know if it's a disease or what it is, but there's so many people who are insecure and always worried about what other people think instead of what God thinks. And I think uh, way back in the years of chocolateites, when I was a young man, um, that became one of my favorite verses of God is for me who can be against me, no one is. And, and when that becomes a part of your soul, your inward clock, clockworks, you go, I don't really care what people think. And that's good and bad. Because as your hired holy man, the pastor, sometimes I say things because I don't care what you think. But I do care what God thinks. So sometimes I think what God thinks is going to be funny, and you might not think it's so funny. Like this joke I'm about to tell you, I think is hilarious. Now, I don't want it to be offensive, but I think it's kind of funny. And it goes like this. Why don't blind people sky? Now, I'm not dissing on blind people at all or anything like that. But, it, and some of you guys probably have blind friends. My mom's greatest fear is to go blind. My greatest fear is to go blind. I think everybody's greatest fear is to go blind. I know we have an eye doctor here, so it's a great fear. But why don't blind people sky Do you guys know why? Scares the crap out of their dogs. <laughs> now, I think that's fine. <laughs> but I remember I think the world I think Lord, that is a stupid one. So that's the way your pastor thinks so far. Because in my mind, I have a kid mind. My mind is like a little kid. And I can envision a blind guy and this and the you know the dude strapped to him and the dog. And the dog with just terror, you know? Anyways, I'm a dog over to We, uh, uh, last week, we, we looked at, uh, and, and I said, well, every Sunday, even though we're going through the Bible, you know, uh, I'm not doing anything that builds, kind of today, but last week, we looked at trust, trust in God, and described how the Bible teaches how to become a Christ follower, what it means to trust in God, to put your faith, your whole weight on God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, and, and Jesus bridges the gap between all of humanity and God. And the death is being separated from God. There's also hell because unless you believe in Christ, that's your final destination. Your soul's final destination is hell. And uh, I want to keep going. And uh, but I want to talk about obedience. O B E D I E N C E. Right? Obedience. And uh, you know. How many of you guys are parents? Raise your hands. Okay. One of the goals of a parent is to hopefully raise kids that obey you, that obey others, that are polite, that are, you know, don't disrespect adults. That's one of our goals, is obedient. And uh, when a person crosses that line of faith, and last week they had a, a quite a few people that actually understood what it means to be a Christian, they crossed the line of faith for the first time. But, but what happens is, now it's like, okay, God says, I love you, and, and he gives us grace because we're going we're gonna to screw up. We're going to make mistakes. Uh, but now it's like, giving it your best shot by the means of the Holy Ghost, God, the Spirit working in you to be obedient to God. And that is to obey uh, this thing called the children's manual for life. And so as we obey God, uh, most of the time, there's blessings that follow obedience. There's usually blessings that follow obedience. And sometimes the blessings are not what we would think should be a blessing. Like, you know, the numbers of the lottery also appearing on your hand. You know, that's what I thought was. But there's blessings. So, we're in 2 Kings chapter 2. And, uh, we saw that Elijah just got caught up in a chariot of fire. He never died. And the idea is that, as I explained last week, that when you become 
become a Christ follower, you can put me trust in Jesus Christ, you never die. You just, you just live forever, eternity. Eternity is what we have to look forward to. So, uh, there's no midlife crisis because there's no midlife. Because we're, we're having fun. And uh, a light jug gets taken up in a chariot of fire. And then Elijah is under the reef. The way you can remember Elijah and Elisha, because they're so close. Elijah was first, because J is before S in the alphabet. Get that? J is before S. I mean, listen, I was in Bible college, and I, Elijah, who was first? I didn't know. Then why my professor said, if you remember, J is before S, I'm like, a light bulb. But bing, I go, okay, you got it. Elijah, and then Elisha. Elijah was mentored by Elijah. Elijah gets up, taken in a chariot of fire, never dies, goes and sees God, that's it, it's over. Now a bunch of the uh, prophets there, they say to Elisha, they go, let's go find them. Maybe, you know, they dropped them off down at the 7-Eleven, loaf and jug or something. No, no, no. And Elisha's like, no, he's gone, he's in heaven, but he lets him do it anyway. Well, then there's Elijah's first miracle. Now, the Old Testament is full, and the New Testament is full of really cool miracles. Mind-blowing. I, I told some of you guys a few weeks ago the story of, you know, that I didn't think you would believe it. It's kind of unbelievable about the lady who smuggled her dead husband on the plane and, because she didn't want to pay the big bucks to put him in the bottom of the plane. And, and uh, what happened? And if you weren't here for that, you missed it. That was really good. It was kind of an unbelievable story, but it's a true story. And we said that, you know, the fact that the Bible is ridiculously true, the evidence is overwhelming on the truth of the Word of God. So we have all this truth of the Word of God, we have all these stories, and we had Elijah gone, Elijah's coming, and now this is this thing of obedience. And we saw what happened when people didn't listen to the Word of God. They got eaten by lions. Now if you make fun of God, you're going to get eaten by a lion. Let me explain this. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. One day, the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. We have a problem, my lord, they told him. This town is located in a pleasant surrounding, as you can see, but the water is bad. It's nasty. It's like living in old Montana. That's some nasty water out there. Sun Prairie is worse, I think. It's bad water. How many of you guys have bad water in your house? Okay, you all live in town. Oh, there's one. I have my, my water. Anyways. Almost had an ADD moment. Then Elijah said, bring me a bowl with salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring. And that's a part of the tower of water. Threw the salt into it. And he said, this is what the Lord said. I appeared by this water. I will no longer cause death to or infertility. And the water has remained pure ever since, just as Elijah said. Now listen, when I read this, I think of my water salt. And it's full of salt. Okay, maybe that's how they got the information to invent the water software. I don't know. But, you know, it's stuff like that. I catch on to it, maybe. All right, I'll keep going. Elijah left Jericho and went to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, a group of boys from the town began mocking and making fun of him. Go away, baldy, they chanted. Go away, baldy. Now, isn't that funny? Elijah was a hairy dude. So Paul said, dude said no. Anyway, so they're making fun of Elijah. Now remember, Elijah is a prophet of God. He represents God. They're making fun of God through Elijah. This is what Elijah said. This is good stuff. And you will wish that you could do this as you were driving to work one day. When somebody does not know how to drive, you wish you could do some of this stuff. This is what happens. Elijah turned around and looked at them. And cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of them. <laughs> Wouldn't you just like to be driving down the road, some dude makes fun of you, and you go, you know, I curse you with God, and then the neighborhood dogs attack them. <laughs> Same thing. From there, I mean, and that's it. It's just like a matter of fact. And two bears came out of the woods and mauled them. We got lions eating people and bears mauling people. You think the word would get around that you should obey God? 
From there, Elijah went to Mount Carmel and finally returned to Samaria. Now let's look at uh, uh, the son, like father, like son, uh, Ahab's son, Joram. Chapter 3, beginning. So Ahab's son, Joram, began to rule over Israel in the 18th year of King Jehoshaphat's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 12 years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat anything. So, uh, 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 Ahab and his wife Jezebel were bad people. Bad. Disobeyed God. All the time. And then God, for you guys that weren't here, it, it's so funny because Ahab was a bad king. And then he would send a prophet and, and the prophet would say, King, you're going to die. And then the king would go home and he would whine and cry and ask for forgiveness. And then God would say, okay, you're going to live. And then he would be bad again, and he'd say, you're going to die. And then he would repent, and then he would live. And then finally, the dogs licked the blood off his chariot because he did not make it. Now his son, you would think, you would think that if you saw the hand of God working, you would think you would be sharp enough to go, I should listen to God. Right? W wouldn't you guys agree? If you saw some of this stuff that happened, you would go, I am going to obey God. But we don't. You know, and I don't know why we don't. We looked at Galatians briefly last week, and I said there's this this natural part of us that just heads out. It's this thing called pride that we know better than God. And, you know, we have however many years God allows us to walk this face of the earth. We, we struggle with this thing called obedience. He gave us the law in the Old Testament that was saw that He gave us um, on Mount Sinai. He said, you need to obey this. You'll be blessed. And they said, okay, we will and we won't. And of course, we got now grace where God says, I love you. I, I covered all your sins through the blood of my son. You, some of you have put your trust in me. You understand what it means to have eternal life. Now you've got to be obedient. You go, okay. But it's, it's, it's tough. You know, when I tell people when they cross the line of faith, God promises them eternally. And he does. There's no doubt about it. But now to live as a man of God, to live as a woman, to practice Romans 8, 31, if God is for me, who can be against me? No one. To have all your security, not in your money, but in God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. See, that's what the prophets represented. The prophets represented it that represented God, and God would take care of everything. All they had to do was trust in God. To believe, to put their whole weight in God, which seems to be quite the challenge, which seems to be quite the challenge today to believe 100% obey God. Verse 13. And King Jerome, he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, but not the same to the extent as his father and mother, but at least tore, he at least tore down the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had set, set up. Nevertheless, he continued in the sins that Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, had committed and led people of Israel to, to commit. So, maybe he wasn't as bad, but many of you know that have read the New Testament, sin is sin. God doesn't, God doesn't say this sin is way up here, this sin is way down here. This is just mediocre sin. No, all sin is sin. All disobedience is disobedience. He does not. Does not measure. But I'll put him on the cross. Well, chapter 3 goes on and says that King Mishmashbol, he was a sheep breeder. Well, King, King Misha decided that uh, he wasn't going to you know, kind of pay his taxes to Jer Jerome. Um, so Jerome says, I'm, I'm going to attack. And he gets the other king, uh, Jehoshaphat, uh, to, to go along with him. But before they attack, they go see 
Jehoshaphat says, listen, man, we need to consult with God. Now, it's interesting, all whenever there's a, a major event, even the kings who were kind of far from God, thinking they knew it all, would consult with God. You would think that you and I today would consult with God on a daily basis. I would hope that when you get up in the morning, you would consult with God. And say, dear God, what's, what's happening today? What? Please guide and direct my heart, my soul. Maybe there's going to be a God encounter that day. Maybe somebody needs some, some money. Maybe somebody just needs a gentle hand. Maybe somebody just needs a word of encouragement. Or maybe you're going to go to the marketplace where you have just struggled with your co-people, the people that you work with. You've just struggled with them and they're driving you nuts. And you say, God, how can I deal with this difficult situation? You know, how often do you consult with God? We call that prayer, but that's what it is. And you understand when you consult, you have to learn to listen. You see, the king's problem was, well, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and pride gets in the way, and so we choose not to listen to God, and we choose not to be obedient to God. And that's the difficulty. That's the hard part. But that's life. And so, it's, it, it should be your practice to have some time of prayer, consulting with God, and then listening. Maybe on your way to the office, maybe whatever it takes, just stopping and listening, the art of listening to God. King Jehoshaphat knows that they need to talk to God. And so, he says, we need, to, we need to go see a prophet. Verse 12, Jehoshaphat said, yes, the Lord speaks through him. So the king of Israel and Judah and Edom went to consult Elijah. Why are you coming to me, Elijah asked the king of Israel. Go to the pagan prophets your father, of your father and mother. And I like it because the higher holy men, they're kind of smart actors. Oh, you're going to talk to me now? Why don't you go talk to that statue over there? I would have done, I would have said the same thing. My name is Ken, not Elijah, but I would have said the same thing, Elijah. Why are you coming to me, Elijah asked the king of Israel. You know, go to your pagan God. Verse 14, Elijah replied, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, I wouldn't even bother with you except in my respect for King Jehoshaphat of Judah. Now bring me someone who can play the harp. They bring him the harp, he hears from God. And he prophesies to them, and he says, you're going to win the aid. They're going to win this battle. God's going to send some rain. And the rain puddled, looked like blood. The Moabites came out. They saw. They thought they fought against themselves. They ran in to beat up Israel and Judah. They lost. Even in your worst moments of life, consult God. Even when you screw up, consult God. Because you never know the blessing that may come about, even though you screw up. How many of you guys have ever screwed up? Sometimes isn't it true though when we when we fall short, when we know we, we mess up, we go, I, I'm not even talk to God. I'm a loser. You know. You feel shameful when shame eats your soul up. And you gotta deal with it. You just and I love the fact that people that are sharp, even though we screw up, you screw up, during those moments of failure, we go, okay, I still got to cry out to God. And it's amazing, we see these kings who just mess up, but God, God takes care of them. And I'm like, alright, if God takes care of them, He's definitely going to take care of me. <coughs> now, in their obedience, they were blessed. Now, Elijah, I like it, helps forward chapter 4. One day, the widow of a member of the group of the prophets came to Elijah and cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord, but now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do for you, Elijah asked. Tell me what to do. What? Tell me what you have in the house. Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elijah cried, Borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jar, setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Oh, isn't that amazing? Listen, did you did you get that? Now that's just the, that's the only thing that's important. She was obedient. She did what she was told. 
Now, can you imagine her? She's got one little jar of olive oil. And the hired holy man, the man of God, Elijah, tells her, listen, go home. Go get as many jars as you can. Go borrow them. Then borrow them. Not steal. That would be wrong. As many jars as possible. And then take that jar of oil, olive oil that you have and fill it each one of them up. And so she goes home, gets her boys, and she fills them all up. And they're all full. Now, come on. That's like God telling you, you know, um, you're about to go to court, you're about to claim bankruptcy, and God says, I want you to take, and I don't want you to go to this place and tell me you need a job. They're going to pay you a half a million dollars. You go, no, I'm not going to do that. Is that stupid? And you miss half a million dollars. Because she could have said, Elijah, you're nuts. Now, wait a second. We, we could, let's justify it. Let's justify our actions, because I'm good at it. Are you good at justifying your disobedience? Yes, because there's always a good reason to be disobedient. Always. There's never not a good reason to be disobedient. There's just good reason to be disobedient. We're all pros at it. We're all good at it. If we're heart and we're beaten, we're alive, we're good at being disobedient. So here's the deal. Let's think about this. The pastor, I haven't seen, you know, people get eaten by a bear when they were cursed by God. I don't know if anybody got eaten by a lion lately by being disobedient to God. I don't know a whole, of a whole town that their water got purified instantly because of God. You know, I haven't seen any of this stuff. I don't, I'm not even sure God exists. Really. You're not living the state of Montana and see the creation that God has made for us around us. Do you not believe there is a God? A God that is un we can't understand it. He's God. We're not. Obedience is just saying, okay, you're God and I'm not. Do you get that? Obedience is saying, you're God, I'm not. Obedience is knowing that God has your best interest in mind. Even in the New Testament, he told, uh, he told the, as Jesus was speaking, he said, in uh, uh, Matthew 7, he said, here's the deal, you know, please ask me anything. I'll make sure you get it. I'll take care of you. He goes, even the unbelieving world, if their, their, their son or daughter asks for a peanut butter jelly sandwich, he doesn't give them a serpent. Even they know how to do what's good. I'm God. I know even better. I know even better. Isn't that good? So, she obeyed. She was taken here. But it's so daggone hard to obey, isn't it? Because don't you know more than God? Look at the person next to you and say, I know more than God. Go ahead, tell them. And let them know. You've already let them know. If you're married to somebody, they go, oh, I, think, I know you think you know more than God. We know you know more than Pastor Kevin because... He's a terrible Christian. We talk about every time we believe on something. We've said that. And we know more than that guy on the radio. We definitely know more than a lot of those political people. They're all stupid. I'd rather be the president. We could do a better job. I mean, that's the comments on Facebook, you know. The reality is, you're not God. God is God. And he just says, trust me. Obey me. Obey me. With everything you have. You know why I find Christians don't enjoy being a Christian? Because they don't really obey God. They never get to see the miracles of God work because they never obey Him 100%. I call that being a budgeted Christian. Being a Christian living on a budget. I, I, I don't know how else to put it, you know. I grew up with a mom who loved God, but man, she's like, you know, we, we got to live on a budget. Lord knows my mom lived on a budget. Lord knows I rebelled against that budgeting crap. And I have been off budget my whole life. When we started this ministry, people said, you can't start a ministry. You can't, you're not going to get paid. Well, we'll figure that out. God will bless you. God is taking care of you. See, because God takes care of God's people. Trust and obey, he will take care of you. 
And, I, and, 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 and it's funny, my dad always told me, when you give, give by faith. What does that mean, Dad? Give more than you think you were budgeted for. Let God take care of the rest. Otherwise, you never get to see the hand of God work. You don't get to see the hand of God work because all you're doing is living on a budget. The widow, her husband died. A means to survive financially. She couldn't handle it. She couldn't do it. Her sons are going to be taken away as slaves to pay his debt. She goes to Elijah, the man of God, representing God, and says, here's the deal. What are we going to do? And he says, you got one jar of power oil? Take it home. Find all the jars you can. Ask all your neighbors. Get all the jars you possibly can. Fill them up. They do. They do. Fill them up. Fill them up. So finally, your son goes, that's it. That's all I got. There ain't no more. Unbelievable. She took all the olive oil, paid off her debt. Obedience. Obedience is never easy. i got to be admit that. Obedience sometimes is really difficult. God will ask you to do things that will stretch you, that will cause your faith to grow. But that's a good thing. You know? It's a good thing because, really, if, you know, if you don't have a good rainstorms, good thunderstorms in your life, or you need to have some faith, you don't grow. You just live in the desert. There's a, uh, the next story is a guy named Naaman. And, uh, in uh, chapter 5, the king of Aram had great ad admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army. Because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman uh, was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. Now, I, I can't give you, you know, I'm not a medical doctor, but leprosy just, it kills all the nerves in your body. And eventually, you know, you... I remember reading this book and it was describing it as, as if I put a key because I have feelings in my fingertips and the nerves in our fingertips are definitely different than the nerves on your belly, on your back. And the nerves on the bottom of your feet may be more like the nerves on your fingertips. So if I took a key and I put it into a, a lock and the lock was broken, I could turn it, turn it, turn it, but eventually I'd go, man, it's not going to work. And I could feel the pain as, as the pressure. Well, leprosy destroys all those nerves, so the person with leprosy would put in the lock and turn it, turn it, turn it, until his fingers would fall off. Because there's no pain. Because pain is a good thing. And that's what leprosy would do. It would kill the nerves and turn white. Pretty soon your finger would fall off, your arm would fall off, you shake your head, your head would fall off, and you'd be dead. Well, I'm not sure exactly how it went like that. But that was it. It was bad. And there was no cure for it. And Nathan, the general of Aram's army, army got leprosy. And uh, uh, so also we see this major test that uh, that God throws at King Naaman. Naaman has a, uh, uh, a young lady who is kind of a servant at the house, taking care of her. And she was uh, uh, from Israel. And she knew the hand of God. She seen the hand of God work. She knew about Elijah. She knew about Elisha. And she knew about the prophets of God. And, and they did. And so she's bold enough to tell Naaman's wife that, listen, you just got to go over and see Elisha. And he'll tell you what to do. And he will cure you of, of that. She tells the king. And, and, and Nathan sees Aaron. And he says, listen, you got to go. you got to go to Israel. you got to get this cured. And, uh, okay. And uh, so they get on a horse. And they gallop. And, and the old army, and he brings like some gold and some silver. And some uh, barbecue. And some watermelon. And chicken. And they get on the horse, they got And they got some camels there behind because they're slow. But they're they're like the uh, uh, semi trucks full of goods. And uh, they go to see the king of Israel, and the king of Israel, and it's Israel, it's just, it's like, what are you doing here? They're gonna kill us. And uh, uh, he goes, No, my, my servant girl and says, says that you know you can cure them. And the king rips his clothes, he's like, Oh my god, they're gonna come, they're gonna kill us. And so Elijah sends a, what's that guy's name? Gushuite. Somebody read that for me. Gushi. Like, All right, I got it in my Bible. I can't remember the guy's name. Gushuite. Somebody look at this. All right, it's got to hold on. I can't remember this cat's name because he's a, he's a character. Gehezi, isn't it? Gehezi? Hold on. Yeah, Gehezi. So anyways, he, he works for Elijah. And uh, 
guy, he tells the king, king, king tells Gehazi, listen, tell Elijah, uh, this guy's coming, he wants to be healed. And so Gehazi tells the king, tell Naaman, come on over to my house, we'll take care of him. So now, Naaman, he's, he's a commander. He listens to this young lady, which he doesn't do at all. He goes to his enemies, doesn't do this normally. Tell it says he's sick and he wants to be healed. Well, that's kind of like letting your defenses down. Now he has to go see Elisha, who he's not sure about anyways. He knocks on the door and Elisha never even comes out. Yeah, he comes out. And uh, uh, David is kind of ticked off, like, hey, show me some respect. I am, you know, I'm a commander. Show me some respect. He says, no, this is what you got to do. You got to go down to the Jordan River and you got to dunk yourself seven times in it. Now, this is obedience. This is obedience, and he's not even a believer. But he is sick. He is dying. He wants to be healed. So he says, no, I'm not doing it. Forget it, man. I'm not going to the Jordan River. I'm not even going to jump in the Jordan River. It's so stinky, so filthy. It's kind of the river when you jump in. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You jump in some of those rivers, and your leg goes way down just a bucket wire, and you're thanking God you can get the thing out of you. And it's slimy and it's gooey, and you, and you know that there's some leeches in there just sucking the blood right out of your leg. It's, so he's like, no way am I going down to that river. And, and all, all, this, all the people around King Naaman, the, Naaman go, listen, the king wants you to get healed. You're a great leader. Put your stinking pride aside and do what Elijah tells you to do. Finally, he's like, all right, fine. So he goes down to the river. And, and he, 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 he wants to go to these other really nice rivers like the Missouri or uh, Felt Creek, something clean, you know. But instead he says you got to go down to the Chicago River. That stinks and dirty, dead fish are around. So he's got to go down there, and that's where he goes. And, and, and then he puts his foot in the water, he's like, and, and you know he's down there. I'm not going to go in, you know. You know you got to go in. So he goes in one time, and, and he says, you gotta, you got to go under seven times. And you got to understand, you know, he's... Really? i got to do this seven times? I've got to be obedient, you know? So finally he goes down, gets to the river, and everybody's, come on, you got to get into the river. It's kind of like being baptized. I know so many people are afraid to get baptized. Well, I believe in God. God says we'll go down the river, get baptized. You know? Because it's just pride. It's just pride. The same thing that Nathan's dealing with right now. Pride. God says, do this. You say, no, I don't want to. So he goes down and, and you know, first he goes out to the river and you have to get deep enough so you can put your head on the wall. So, in my property, uh, out in all, I got a little place right going to the river. Man, you got to walk a long way out there. You know, so you got to walk a long way out there and he's walking a long way out there. And you know, every step, the mud is just going up to his knees. And he has to, you know, they get that pull his legs out of the cruddy mud. And, you know, he knows leeches are sucking the blood out of him. Anyways, he finally gets out to where he can stand and deep enough where he can... And you, you can see his army. You can just listen to him talking. Look at Naaman. That's our leader. You know Naaman's cursing under his breath. So he has to go down. He has to dunk seven times. So he goes in the water. You know, you know how it is. Guys. It's like, whoa. You, you, you go down and it's cold. Even if it's not cold, it's cold. And you get up and, and everybody goes, one! He's like, and then he gets the stink of a stinky river in his nostrils. He sucked a little bit in. He's like, oh, please. You know? So he has to go down two times. Looking at his skin, it's still white and blotchy, and he's afraid to shake his finger because it could fall off. Three, four, five, six times. And you know by the seventh time, he's like, oh, well, one more time, ain't nothing going to happen. And he goes down, and he comes up, and his skin is clean. He's healed 100%. He was obedient. He did what the man of God said, and God healed him. Now, he can't get out of the river fast enough. He just got saved. He is redeemed. He's hallelujah. He becomes charismatic. Ah! And he runs out of the river. Because you know what? Hey, would you be happy? You know people that have had cancer and they're cured. They are happy, happy, happy. They wear cancer-free t-shirts. They live in life large. Because they were just on the verge of death. And all of a sudden, bam, they got a new, new lease on life. That's Naaman. He was finally obedient and he's alive. 
And he's got, he's got gold, he's got silver, he's got all kinds of cash rewards. And he, he says, come on. And he gets on his horses and the chariots and the camels, the sandwich truck and all. And they go back to see Elijah and they bang on the door. And he goes, man, a lot, tell Elijah I got, I got, you know, some, some great harvest bread for him, some cookies, some of those Korean donuts that are really good. I got, and I got cash, I got mountains of cash, I got clothing, I got, and it's yours. And Elijah goes, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. Because God says, I don't need it. See, he's representing God. He says, I don't need it. I needed you to be obedient at least one time to do what I said because you can see the blessings once you... And of course, his response was, what did it cost you? And God's going, no, 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 that's not it. You just needed to be obedient. God just said, wants us to be obedient. He'll do the blessing however they may show up. But then there's his cat, Gehazi. Gehazi's like, yo, alive. You know, we got some. We could use the cat. You would think that a guy that's hanging out with a hired holy man that sees the hand of God work would go, I'm just going to obey him. But no, Gehazi's like us. His security was not in God. His security was in the things, the temporary things of this world. The temporary. You know, isn't that what screws you up the most in your faith in Jesus Christ is the temporary. You can't give up the temporary. It's about the temporary. We're Americans. It's all about what we have in the bank, what we have in an IRA, what we have in retirement, what we can get. And it's not about that at all. It's about the giver and taker of life. So after this phenomenal miracle, he gives us a picture of you and I. Because Gehazi is you and I. And Gehazi says, we could use some extra cash. He's the accountant for the prophets. And he's looking at the bottom line, and their bottom line wasn't real good. Even though they've seen God work over and over and over again, there's this little doubt, just that human factor that says, I, I, I. So Gehazi disobeys God. He runs out, he finds a lot, he finds Naaman, and Naaman sees, sees him galloping up in his horse, and he takes off in his chair. He goes, what, what, What's up? What's up? Gehazi, well, he goes, uh, Elijah changed his mind and uh, you know we don't we don't want all your money we don't want all the clothing but we can use some clothing we can use a little cash we can use some of the good grain you have and you know we really like the donuts from the Korean donut factory over there and uh, you guys that aren't into donuts your pastor is and that Korean lady can make some donuts now and they're healthy donuts because they're made of air and anyway so um, he says, and, and, and he's like, okay. Gehazi, like you and I, thinks he got away with it. Don't you and I think we get away with disobedience? Nobody knows, nobody sees who's going to find out. Until they audit the books, then they find out everything. But here's what happens. Elijah looks at Gehazi and says, what's wrong with you? You have seen the hand of God work. And now you've disobeyed. You, your family, your family's future, your DNA is going to be smeared with leprosy. That sounds. We often forget, because we live in a time of grace, but we often forget that disobedience brings death, depression, and the diagnosis is destruction. And that's what happened with Gehazi. 
all his ancestors are true. Right. We saw King David, I mean, excuse me, Commander David, deal with it and obey and be blessed. Pagan country, doesn't believe in God, not sure about this God thing at all, really doubts it to the maximum. But he's like, well, what, what should I do? What's the wager? The wager is, I believe in God, and He heals me. I don't believe in God. I don't go to the Jordan River. I don't jump in seven times. And I don't get healed. So what's the wager? It might be a little embarrassed, doesn't work, or it does work, I'm healed. Pascal's wager. There is a God. I believe in God. I die. I win it all. There is a God. I don't believe in God. I die. I lose everything. There's obedience. To be blessed. Beyond your wildness. You can't budget blessings. They're just great things that God gives us.